We're going to start this puppy up. Clear? Drop? And welcome back to Tip of the Week. Now, this is my new project. You might say, what the heck is all of this? Although semi-aviation related, it nonetheless is a great wintertime project. If it looks interesting, stick with me and let's get started. So why an ambulance of all things? Well, as you notice, the Afforda plane is resting as it has gotten quite chilly outside. So it needs to wait before we do further flight testing and modification. So what we have now, the ambulance is ready for a conversion. And we're not talking about some sort of religious conversion. What we mean is that this unit will be converted into a recreational vehicle. Let's talk about why that makes any sense at all. Our first step is to examine exactly what it is we have. So let's come on inside and take a look at this ambulance. So as we enter the rear, this is what we have. Now looking over here on this side, we have the bench with seat belts and cabinets up top and a couple of bars and plenty of lighting on the top. And our side door and more cabinets and more cabinets and then of course the captain's chair and a pass-through really just a window to the cab and on our other side more cabinets take a look at some of these labels Remember, this is supposed to be a medical ambulance. And then we have another seat and more cabinets. And this unit here is the air conditioning heating unit for the module. The module is the back area as opposed to the cab where you drive up front. Looking at the outside of the box unit we notice lots of cabinets. Lots of cabinets. We'll take a quick look inside. We have more compartments and cabinets. Now, you notice we don't have a traditional light bar. Remember, this was 1999, so it's a few years back. But now, let's take a look inside of some of these cabinets. You'll get a kick out of this, possibly. Starting at the back, on the passenger side, at the rear is a 4,000 watt Onan generator. So this supplies 40 amps of 110 volt power that can be started electrically anytime. And that supplies our 115 volts for inside or externally at an emergency scene. If we come around to the other side,
Here is a cabinet at the back, driver's side, with lots of shelves. And here's a small one. Notice one, two gas filling outlets. And this one will be your favorite one. Loaded with 1990s electric. So this is all non-solid state relays, circuit breakers. And there's actually more behind this panel if I were to take this down. So let's take it down so I can show you. You know, screw this thing here. And we have more. Some of this is for the uh, light lighting wigwag, and other is for the 110 volt power outlets on the inside. And then there's some basic simple logic for the lighting, and also for some compressors. We'll take a look at inverter down there. So quite a bit of stuff in here. Down below. And notice the labels, because we're going to talk about these labels in a second. And then one more cabinet. And then our last cabinet on this side, a very tall one. And then one more on the other side. Let's go around. Well, there's more than one more, but another tall one. I'm going to guess this was used for the oxygen bottle because it's a tall cabinet, top to bottom. then this cabinet here, which actually has a pass-through to the inside, but at the very bottom houses a couple of compressors. This compressor is for the air suspension. This has a modified suspension from the original chassis and uses a pair of airbags to raise and lower the back end as desired possibly for loading, and this one is for the air horn. Why does this make such a good conversion for an RV? It is because of the construction. The box back there, the 8x12 enclosed module as they call it, is made out of all aluminum. The frame or the skeleton is tubular aluminum. The skin on the inside and the outside, all aluminum. The ceiling, the floor, all aluminum. They're made to withstand a rollover without being crushed. This is so unlike the construction of a typical RV, which if you look at, might have some aluminum, thin aluminum skeleton inside, but everything else is thin plywood, um, very thin plywood, some fiberglass panels on the outside, uh, some styrofoam, and a lot of screws that kind of hold these things together. The, if you simply look at the roof or the ceiling of an RV, it typically is rubber or some thin fiberglass with lots of seams. They leak, they wear out and everything. This thing is, of course, over 20 years old, and the aluminum hasn't changed. It is built like a tank. Now you might say, well, why don't they make RVs that way? Well, consider the price. An ambulance like this costs, when new, several hundred thousand dollars. Remember, municipalities are purchasing these for safety. Money is not an issue. They are very expensive when they're new. 
obviously after 20 some years old, the chassis and the engine and other components tend to wear out and they're put up for sale. So yes, this is over 20 years old, but the basic structure in the back has not aged at all, especially for the purpose I want it for, and that is to gut the inside, all of those boxes and rails and seats, and what you're left with is a nice square 8 by 12 area that is very solid, no leaks, and easy to build on if you have any experience working with aluminum. Now obviously the chassis and the motor is important too. I got this one from down in Texas, so it spent its entire life in Texas, and it only has 60 some thousand miles on it. You might say that doesn't sound right. 60 some thousand after more than 20 years? It's a 1999. How do you know that that makes sense or that mileage is true? Remember I had you look at some of those labels inside some of the uh, cabinets in there and uh, they were kind of strange. Metal detector, uh, some other things like that. Well, it turns out this particular ambulance was not used for medical purposes. How do I know this? Well, if you look where the labels on the side were pulled off, and it's a little hard to see because there wasn't that much fading with the white color, but this was used by a Texas police department, and on the side it says, Incident Command. This was used for accident investigation, and that's why a lot of the labels inside have to do with measuring tapes, metal detectors, uh, there's uh, some fingerprint uh, labels in there, uh, fingerprint related labels in there, a um, uh, whole bunch of other things. So, and in fact, if you look at the floor, there are some plates on the floor where a gurney should attach once it's rolled in, but this was not used for gurney, so they covered up those latches, that hardware. And uh, not that that makes any difference to me, but the reason I bring this up is 60,000 miles is because over 20 years they didn't investigate every accident. It's not like a regular ambulance that is running every day to the scene because a typical ambulance after 20 years will have multiple hundred thousand miles on it. Um, this one was only used where an investigation was needed so the mileage is much much down. Another reason I picked this one is that most ambulances use diesel engines and diesels are diesels. They're good for a typical application like this. I got one with a gasoline engine, a 454, the large block Chevy from back in the time. And I like that because I'm going to work on it. I am much more comfortable with a gas engine. Um, also, when you're out on the road traveling as an RV, it's always easier to find gas engine repairmen than a diesel mechanic. It's just the way it is. There are a few fewer diesel mechanics to be found if you're in a random location somewhere in the country as opposed to gasoline. I won't be towing anything so the gasoline engine is just fine and it suits me really nice. Um, there's a lot of technical things about a diesel engine you need to be familiar with to uh, keep them running and of course you use diesel fuel instead of gasoline. Gasoline is a little easier to find when you're traveling in the boondocks all over the country so uh, that was just a choice I made. Now, for those of you wondering what they did with all of the fun stuff inside the main cabin here, well, yes, it was pretty much gutted. They took out the, uh, the radio and uh, enough of the components so that it doesn't make any fun noises anymore. But all of this uh, has to go anyhow. It's just taking up uh, space. And yes, I found this on, you guessed it, eBay. And of course, I was looking for it down in the southern part of the country where it's a little drier, because I know what they use on the roads in the winter up here. And did I buy it sight unseen? Well, they had pictures. I did pay a mobile mechanic in the area to go out and check the things I wanted checked before I purchased it. 
I would tell everyone be very careful about buying vehicles remotely because it's kind of like a box of chocolates. You know how that goes. You might get one you like. How can you not love all of the storage cabinets that are to be found here? And of course, these are perfect for installing water tanks, batteries, electrical equipment that's used to be built into the ambulance itself for the purpose of an RV, including uh, for shower and water heaters and uh, the tanks where the stuff goes after it goes through the shower and the toilet, etc. And um, basically, it is a great way to get a solid, solid structure for an RV. It is small. 8 by 12 right? But there's a lot of small RVs out there. So it's a, a very small motorhome. So that's, we got a maybe multiple year project here. It will take time to gut all of the things that we don't want so that we can start over and build the RV the way we want it. But we got the structure and we got the chassis that is just right. And um, so that's what we're going to do this winter. And the plane will wait for nicer weather. I also found out that some of you had not completed your afford a plane so this is perfect time for you to catch up because if you're that far behind me maybe I was going a little too fast. You gotta finish the plane and have it ready to fly. So everyone please back to building and I'm gonna start chipping away at this project here.